Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Greetings from Music City, USA. I am Michael Del Giorno, honored to be filling in for Dr. Savage once again here on the Savage Nation with you. Our phone number, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Don't forget, you can follow all the stories we're covering, and I'm a little ADD, so maybe even a few I miss, at michaelsavage.com. And it's almost November, which means Michael's upcoming book is finally here. He has worked diligently on this uh, for the better part of a year that I'm aware of. And uh, I, for one, am a person of God, a person of faith, and I like to think of myself as a poison of reason. And so I can't think of a better title, and we're all very anxious to see what Michael has discovered and written for us. God, Faith, and Reason. It's coming out this November, and it's never too early to order. All right, I want to start with something. Um, I was always a big, this can tell you a lot about me. I was always a big fan as a kid of Cliff's Notes. Anybody remember those? They were always available at the drugstore. You know, it would be time to do Kill a Mockingbird or time to do Lord of the Flies. And your teachers would always warn you, don't go get the Cliff's Notes. But you see, I love Cliff's Notes. They just get to the heart of it. Nobody's changing the meaning. meaning. Nobody's omitting anything. Just nice and concise, get to the point. And I think, unlike, you know, literary scholars who can tell you the books that have influenced and changed their lives, Cliff's Notes have changed my life. Allowed me to get more in there, the essence of more in there. But I, I'm a, it, it has, I think, shaped me into a bottom line person. What do I mean? I mean, you have something like 9-11, which I think there are people, well, there are leaders today, still don't have their arms around. And uh, that was not an event. It wasn't even the first time it struck the World Trade Center, right? No, this is a four, an awakening to a 1,400-year war. And it has a profit. And it has a motive. And it's left clues. And we clearly know how it wins, and then we clearly know how it's defeated. You, know, you get right to it. Well, the 9-11 Commission, they came to this final conclusion. Failure of imagination. Failure of imagination. At the end of the day, there was a lot of things we learned. Local law enforcement needs to know what the CIA knows, what the NSA knows, what the Pentagon knows. Yeah, we learned some things, but... In essence, ultimately, how did it happen? Failure of imagination. Nobody ever dreamt they'd use box cutters, take over planes, and use them like a missile. Failure of imagination. We look at Ronald Reagan, I think arguably one of the greatest presidents who ever lived. Why? And you can have a lot of different theories, and I have several theories. One is that, you know, after a crook, a clumsy ox, uh, a Sunday school teacher moron, here comes a dad we could believe in. There was that father presence, and it was welcomed after chaos in the White House for administrations. Others have pointed to he was a great communicator, and he took advantage of as a soundbite president. He knew how to communicate in very small sound bites. Oh, Kennedy, Kennedy mastered television debate. He mastered the news conference. But Reagan mastered the soundbite. You know what I think ultimately was Ronald Reagan's greatness? And the answer could clearly be all of the above, but this is the one kind of like failure of imagination I arrived at. Ronald Reagan held up a mirror to us all and said, look in it. This is what you were intended to be, and this is what you are. Not only are we better than that, we will be better than that, and we must be better than that. He held up a mirror. And I think that, too, has had a great deal of an influence on me. So I'd like to hold up a mirror to you. Thanks to Dr. Savage, not me, thanks to his long career, he has built an audience of millions. I never sat around and dreamt about it, but if I ever did, hey, I'm on WABC in New York, even though I'm sitting here in Nashville, Tennessee. I want to hold the mirror up, and I want you to be honest, and I want you to look into it. 
I'm going to say something because I just haven't heard anybody but me saying it. Now, I happen to know from talking to the producers in Dallas that Michael has been covering this, and, and thank God for that. Just as a disclaimer, Michael, Jack, uh, Michael Savage comes on at 10 o'clock at night here. By 10 o'clock at night, either the Chicago Cubs or my children have sent me to my room crying. So I, didn't, I haven't had a chance to hear him, but I think his, uh, his home would dictate his focus. But I'd like to hold up a mirror to all of us. I'd like us all to look into it and be honest about what we see. You know, whether it's a shooting in Las Vegas, whether it's a wildfire in, Las Ve- in, uh, in California, whether it's a terrible uh, flooding in Texas or a storm surge and hurricane in, in Florida and elsewhere, what drives my heart, what drives my mind and drives my attention is the sacredness of human life. And it's a simple notion that, yes, it's happening to them, but that could be me. Yeah, it's happening to them, but it may be me next. Never mind that. I honor, I love, I worship a creator, and his creation is in harm's way. So whether it's ISIS killing Christians simply for being Christians over there, a hurricane here, a wildfire there, it's the sacredness of life that demands my attention, demands my compassion, demands my action. Now, we make a lot of cases about bias, media bias. This goes beyond just media. There's a human American bias. I want to know why we would spend two weeks talking about a shooter in Las Vegas, and we should, and ignore these fires. Quite frankly, not only am I making my case, I can't conceive the other side of the case. How is it the same America that cares so much about life when it comes to a hurricane, so much about life when it comes to a shooter or a driver purposely using his vehicle to kill many, can ignore this? I kind of value others' lives more than my own. It's a personal issue, and I don't go to therapy, so we'll probably never really address it, but I love God. It makes me love his creation. I tend to love his animal creation more than his human creation, but that's a whole other story. But what do we love most? Think about it. Our lives, our wives, our husbands, our children, our mothers, our fathers, our friends, our property, our home. Listen, I can tell you this one firsthand. I grew up in New Orleans and my family's still there. I saw Katrina and I saw it through a different lens than you. I saw the streets where all my childhood memories took place, destroyed. I saw every family picture of my existence destroyed. I wasn't there bringing my mother to Oklahoma to live with me for a year and a half. I was there to hold her while everything that she's amassed in life and everything that ever mattered, things and emotions and feelings that FEMA can never restore, State Farm can never restore. Let me tell you something. Any Christian can walk up to somebody and say, it's just stuff. The Lord will bless you until you've lost all your stuff. There's a new study out today, by the way, and if you haven't read it, it's fascinating. It comes out of England, so I half trust it, but they hook people. By the way, I don't even know who the people are that, like, you know, sign up for these things. Cracks me up. I mean, I was once so hard up for money, I mowed a lawn. I was never so hard up for money, I let people hook things up to my brain. But they take these people and they hook their brains up to all this technology and equipment and they show them images. Now, if they knew you, they would show you the park where you played Little League. Wrigley Field. The home of the baseball team you love. An area restaurant that's local, kind of a mom and pop your sidewalk, your elementary school, places. And then they would show you objects. Could be like one of your favorite shirts in your closet. Could be your whatever. And what they found consistently and persistently was that the parts of the brain that control emotions and true joy and true happiness and true meaning all responded to places and not things.
Now envision everybody in California. Their places are up in smoke. Their places are being destroyed. In the same ways as a hurricane, you can only replace things, but you can't replace memories. I guess what I'm holding the mirror up and asking is, how is it possible, whether it's ABC, NBC, CBS, and I won't limit it to them, or CNN, or MSNBC, or Fox News, or anybody else, why is there such a fascination when somebody shoots a gun? Such a fashion, fascination when it's a hurricane, and you probably say, well, because wildfires happen all the time. I got news for you. So do twisters. So do hurricanes. So do volcanoes. So do shooters. Don't look away yet. Keep looking in the mirror. You haven't gotten to the answer yet. How is it this same com- country, this same people that wanted to talk to everybody that was there, what they saw, what they felt, what they survived, talk to anybody who lost anything or lost a loved one, whether it was the hurricane or the shooting, and nobody cares to talk to anybody with the wildfires. The death toll is 31, 31 precious lives. Uh, killed horrifically. So were they. And it's like America doesn't care. I, I think at some point before I even get on to, and we got some real teachable moments today. Amazing teachable moments. The difference between a smart targeted tax cut and what is tax reform, morally, principally, and by definition. You're not getting tax reform. You're getting a targeted tax cut. Okay, call it that, and I'm all right. But don't call it reform. It's not, and don't miss out the real need, rough form, yet to happen. Or the new 25th Amendment whisper campaign against the president really shows how intolerant and desperate the left is. Or what Obama did, illegal. So now everybody's attacking the president for being what? Legal. And an Iran deal. And an honest conversation about the... Probably the most predictable threat on planet Earth, Iran. And we got NFL follow-up. We got Vegas update follow-up. We got Harvey Weinstein follow-up. But before I did anything today, and I don't know how much Dr. Savage has done on this, I think every one of us, before we take a break and come back, should stare right into this mirror and ponder this thought. How is it possible? We care so much about loss of property when it's a hurricane, but not when it's a wildfire. Loss of life when it's a shooter, a hurricane, or a tornado, but apparently not wildfires. And you know the answer already. It just doesn't fit anybody's narrative, does it? You see, when it's a shooter, we can talk about how Islam is the victim and not all the people that just died at the hands of the purest form of 1,400 years of Islam. Or we can talk about, if it's a white person, guns, because that fits an agenda. And if it's hurricanes, we can make it fit the agenda of global warming. But what do we do with the fire? I want to know why the firefighters risking their lives right now in California aren't as amazing, or quite frankly, as the news continues to trickle out, more amazing than we saw on the ground in Las Vegas. Well, in honor of Cliff's Notes, in honor of Ronald Reagan, in honor of the 9-11 Commission, in honor, of, uh, in honor of the simplest breakdown of truth, I want to start today's show and hold up a mirror. I want to know when all the stars are going to gather to do a telethon for the wildfire victims. I want to know when we're going to text the Red Cross our $10 donations for the fire victims. And if not, I want to force you to keep looking in the mirror until you're at least honest about what you see. Now that I got that off my chest, dear Heavenly Father, protect the men and women fighting these fires and every American citizen and their pets and their loved ones fighting for their property and life. And let's start the Savage Nation together next. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. I am 
Miguelini Del Giorno of the Del Giorno Maselli's Uvas and Camusos of upstate New York. And for Michael Savage, Dr. Savage on the Savage Nation. He'll be back on Monday. You can get all the stories at michaelsavage.com. I bring up my Italian uh, heritage because I grew up uh, where words were used that would be inappropriate for radio. And so my greatest fear all my life is that I would ever slip and say a bad word on the air. I think I just slipped and accidentally prayer, prayed on a national radio show. I, you know, if I offended you, tolerate me. Um, I hope that won't uh, upset Michael Savage. It just kind of spontaneously happened. Um, I, I guess because I feel so passionate about this. Uh, the reason I use the whole long analogy of holding a mirror up is I think there's more than just media bias here. I mean, I think anybody can answer. Yeah, there's a narrative. And the people that control the narrative have a certain worldview and it's counter to the worldview that has made this country great and what this country has traditionally had as a worldview i think we can all get that i mean if you could tie it into global warming they'll talk about it if you can talk it into anti-guns you know they'll, they'll talk about it but i mean i think we're all beyond the media a little guilty here isn't life life isn't loss of life and loss of property loss of life and loss of property i think we should all ask ourselves honestly this question i've given for every hurricane i've yet to give for wildfires nobody's ever asked me to give for wildfires i want to do give you the latest stats too uh, california fire authorities have now listed 39 active fires burning across the state um with the worst of the devastation in wine country you know that's probably when america will care there are there are so many people in certain neighborhoods here in nashville that are they're drunks for Jesus. They think they're godly because it's wine, but they're drunks. Maybe when they're paying more, they'll finally catch on to the tragedy. Uh, nine major fires have burnt over 103,000 acres, causing at least 19 deaths and 670 residents to be missing. Fire and safety authorities have found 110 of the 240 people reported missing. Um, you know, a lot of that, some of that was, thank God, due to cellular service. Um, but um, And we've located them. There are still many missing because they are missing, and a death toll that probably will rise. At least 3,500 homes and businesses have been destroyed, including 11 wineries. But it appears that the um, Leap Winery, Stag's Weep Line, Le- Leap Winery um, in Napa, that was reported as lost, has relatively survived. So there's some silver linings, but by and large, the weather's not cooperating. The death toll has risen. And 300 square miles of California is still on fire. We'll take your calls next. 73-855-400-SAVAGE next. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. It's the Savage Nation, and I'm Michael Del Giorno from Music City, USA, filling in for Dr. Savage, who will be back on Monday. Uh, 855-400-7282 is the phone number, as always, 855-400-SAVAGE, which is where we find Wendy in San Francisco. Welcome, Wendy, to the Savage Nation. I'm, I'm actually in Napa. <laughs> oh, Napa, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I I heard um, what you said and, and just wanted to call in and let people know uh, our perspective over here um i have i haven't been in my house and if i have a house and sunday night two hours after the atlas peak fire started uh i my basically saw the flames 10 feet from my house uh i was i was able to grab a couple things but for I mean, I can go on with the stories of, of the whole of the area. We haven't seen the sunshine in five days. You know, it's gloomy. People are sick, dying. Uh, but like you said, the, the first thing that goes through people's minds and mine as well is, is that feeling of even though you have your stuff in your car and your children are fine, is the loss feeling of, of that that security of your memory of not knowing if you'll ever have, be able to go back to that. And, I, and I'll add something else, Wendy. I don't know if you'll find it. And thanks for the call, Wendy. And uh, everybody in the Savage Nation is praying for you and, and your family and your neighbors and your property. Let me tell you what Wendy's going through right now that's even worse, the unknown. You know, 
Um, I used to preach this a lot when Barack Obama was president because he did a lot of really bad things. And then a lot of the really bad things he never got around to, but they were always looming. And uncertainty killed our recovery, stalled our recovery more than anything. Uncertainty is a deadly thing. And what she's going through right, right now is one of the worst phases. You see, the human body, that's, that's why worry is so dangerous. It doesn't know the difference. When you worry about something, it might as well be happening. If you walk around worrying you have cancer, you're putting your mind and your body through the same stress as if a doctor just told you you have it. And, um, and, and, and at least when you're dealing with something, um, you know, you're, you're able to make an assessment. When you're worrying, there is no ceiling. There, there, there are no walls. There's no end. You can go in any direction because it's all conjecture. It's all worry. Eventually, Wendy will get home, and it's either going to be there or it's not. It's going to be either there partially or not at all, or whole and untouched. I mean, we dealt with our share of fires here in Gatlinburg in Tennessee. Let me tell you something. Fires are like tornadoes and hurricanes, man. They got a mind of their own. I stayed at a hotel, and you would go outside, and there'd be this beautiful, pristine, you know, courtyard area and play area, just, you know, landscape to the nines. And if you look just a little beyond it, you can see burnt out black soot on trees. Just depends on how the wind was blowing at that moment. And everything around it burned, but none of that property burned. Uh, So you just don't know. And that is one of the toughest stages, the uncertainty when you're yet to get there to assess. But this is the real thing that's going on that no one's talking about. That nobody, you know, I think what would hurt Wendy's feelings the most It's not that, you know, she narcissistically needs attention. But it goes back to the root of what I was saying. Isn't all life sacred? I mean, perhaps these fires have less to do with the fire as much as a perfect storm. The left, they don't know what to do with it because they can't make it fit their narrative. Doesn't help them get rid of guns. It doesn't prove global warming. So it just burns. And I don't know, is the right guilty of thinking, well, it's California with all the crazies? I pray not. Life is sacred because it is the creation of our creator. And it's sacred whether it's threatened by a gun, by a hurricane, or or by a fire. These are real lives, real stories. We need to be praying for Wendy. I'm not going to accidentally break out into prayer again. I think I'm in enough trouble for one day. To WABC we go in Carolyn. Welcome to the Savage Nation. Hi. Um, Hi. I wanted to call about California. First of all, your prayer was very appropriate. Um, we're on the East Coast. We're in Connecticut. And I feel like we're not getting any news about the fires. I have a daughter who's out there that was woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning. She's pregnant. They have a toddler. They just were told to evacuate with nothing they didn't even have time to take anything with them. They had, they've been evacuated. They, it, it seems like no one cares. It's like they're in a different country. And um, it's been so upsetting. We wait every day to hear if their house is still up or they're, they're not even allowed to go back home. And being pregnant and everything, there's smoke and ash coming from everywhere. Her husband has asked. Mm. And thank God for some friends. They're staying in a house now that's, been empty but they have nothing but just a bed and it's a very scary situation and um abc in new york they've been doing a good job about covering it on their morning news and whatnot but other than that no one's saying anything that's even going everyone's just not like it's not happening and uh we live in fear for for our family out there and everyone and the firefighters every day are putting their way their lives in danger and they live on a farm they had to get horses and pigs and they weren't even allowed initially to go get the horses down so there's so much livestock that's you know uh, misplaced and they're not even talking about the death of all the livestock either you know it's a very scary situation and i thought all the actors and actresses lived in california and it's (laughs) it's their state what what are they doing please carolyn don't make my head explode i've got a uh, carolyn thanks for the call Uh, you know look I think it's an easier question. Why? I don't know. Uh, Are car chases that much more exciting than fires? 
Yeah, you look at the Weather Channel, for example. How come Jim Cantore doesn't go stand at the fire and sit there and choke in the smoke like he stands ridiculously in the wind during our? I'm not making fun of him. I'm just making a point. Describing to you why it's happening, why no one cares, why no one's talking about it, why no one's doing anything. Doing anything is, to me, the biggest thing. Why aren't I? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. We were nowhere near a hurricane, though they both arrived three days later. And they were given the Red Cross number. Text your $10. Get this money. People were rising up and filling up trucks and supplies. Mass calls for prayer and nothing for the fires. Now, I don't have to tell you that not long after the first shots were fired... We didn't leave the Mandalay Bay for days, 24 hours a day, continuous coverage. The news conferences, on the hour, every three hours. Senators were there, representatives were there, governors were there, fire was there, law enforcement was there, emergency was there, the federal government was there. Everybody was watching, everybody was discussing, everybody was caring, everybody was giving, everybody was doing telethons. You know, to Carolyn's point, this is California. Are the stars silent because, well, their entire empire is burning right now thanks to Harvey Weinstein? Or how about like when you're watching the National Football League and they'll always stop to let you know that we're supporting the victims of Hurricane blank and blank. Why didn't anybody seem to care? Why is anybody giving? Why is anybody raising? Why does anybody care where these displaced people are and who's taking care of them and where they're going and how are they eating and are they getting replacement clothes? Nobody wants to interview a firefighter? And I think it says more than just about the media. I think it says something about all of us. Maybe to some degree we've all been frauds. I got to admit, I kind of live in a little bit of a bubble. I'm, Carolyn made a reference to livestock. I have 37 pets in my home. I think I'm a hoarder. <laughs> I'm not really, but some of them are goldfish and mice. Uh, I'm preoccupied, as Robert knows, in Dallas with my new lizard. But, um, you know, I have been talking about these fires from the beginning. You know why? Because I'm sincere in my love for my creator, and I'm sincere in my love for his creation whether it's a tree, whether it's an animal, or especially his best creation, human being. And whenever humans are threatened, I'm always caring. Why? Because it is them. Because it could have been me. Because it may be me next. It may be someone I love next. Because I'm a fellow human being. But it's amazing how everybody's compassion runs dry if it doesn't fit a narrative and agenda. And I think my point of bringing it up today in the Savage Nation was to simply make this point. I mean, we've been all a little full of it. Look, if the media, and I agree with this statement, and I have made this statement before, they have a worldview. It's antithetical to mine, and I think most of you that listen to the Savage Nation, oh, they're biased. They'll distort, they'll deceive, they'll lie, they'll hide. You saw them do it with Harvey Weinstein. You'll see them do it day in and day out. I used to make a good living pointing out the bias of media. A lot of people listening on KFAQ in Tulsa know what standing up for what's right means. I don't have to make those cases anymore. Everybody knows the media is deceitful, despicable. But it's one thing for me to say to you, they have a different worldview than the most in America. They have a different worldview than me and perhaps you, but they control the narrative. But you see, with me, they never do control the narrative. I don't ever trust them. I don't ever wait for them to tell me. I go learn for myself. Whether they cover it or not, I know these fires are going on. I didn't know Wendy by name or Carolyn by name or her kid's story. But I knew they were going on, and I had compassion and eye care. I'm just wondering where everyone else is.
Now, you can have these conversations. I know uh, Charlie on WABC wants to make the point. People don't care because it's only middle class white people affected. Look, we can't seem to have any conversations without it always coming back to either sexism, racism, socioeconomic standing, all the things that divide us daily. And I understand our brain is kind of trained to think that way. No, I think we're frauds. I think we do a lot of things in the name of humanity and caring when it's really just PR, political correctness, posh. I don't want you to miss these fires because these people need your prayer and they're going to need our help. But I also don't want you to miss it because there's a great teachable moment when you hold the mirror up and look into it to see who the real frauds are. And remember them. Trust them a little less. Spend a little less time with them moving forward. All right, from the fires to the president, we go next on the Savage Nation. I'm Michael Del Jordan for Dr. Savage. We'll be back on Monday. Phone number 855-400-SAVAGE. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. This is the Savage Nation. I'm Michael Del Giorno from Nashville, Tennessee, in for Dr. Savage. He'll be back on Monday. You can follow all the stories because he never stops covering the news at michaelsavage.com. And it's never too early to pre order, especially now. The book will be out in November God, Faith, and Reason, the latest from Michael Savage. Make sure you get your pre ordered copy in. Well, you know, as often as the case, I think my ultimate job is to, um, this is just how I view it, make sure that my audience knows what's going on. Meaning, we can drown in news sources, whether it's news websites, social media. I mean, everybody's, you know, there's information everybody. I think my job is to go look at everything that's out there and say, well, these are the five or six or seven things we can get to today. But at least if we get to them, you're going to know what's really going on. Because I don't want you walking around taking your cues from a media that lies to you. And I want you to really understand it. Because I really think the ultimate threat to our republic is ignorance and apathy. You know, well, we don't have time to take Bob's call, but Bob was going to say, you know, people are just tired of all the bad news. Maybe that's why they're not following the fires. Well, anybody in the information business is in charge of telling people what's happening of import. And whether you find it interesting or not, I can't, you know, it's my job to make it interesting or make it entertaining, but sometimes you can't. And if it's bad news, it's bad news. If it's good news, it's good news. But sometimes it's just not good news because it's not presented that way. The president's getting a lot of grief, of course, from Nancy Pelosi, of course, from Chucky e. Schumer, of course, from everybody at CNN. But what did he really do? Well, the Trump administration announced that the cost sharing reduction payments, these are payments to health insurers. Yes, they have propped up Obamacare that was poorly designed. It's not going to kill Obamacare. Obamacare is walking terminally. Time is what's killing Obamacare. It's unsustainable. It's a bad product and was poorly designed. And it hasn't achieved any of its goals. It did not insure everyone. It did not lower premiums. It raised them. And it did not make health care more accessible. It made it less accessible. But it had these different funding mechanisms. And so the CSR payments are now prohibited unless and until validated as an appropriation. Why? Because the executive branch executes. The legislative branch creates laws and funds. Because that's our constitutional republic. That's our checks and balances. That's our branches of government. That's the law. Sessions puts out the legal opinion. As you are aware, the prior administration originally sought an appropriation to fund CSR payments, suggesting it believed such an appropriation was necessary, but then later it concluded that Section 1324's permanent appropriation was available. Therefore, it wasn't. The U.S. House of Representatives sued, contending the Congress had not appropriated the funds. In other words, the executive branch overstepped its bounds and you exercised a power it doesn't have. The U.S. District Court in the District of Columbia agreed. The Obama administration then appealed, and the appeal was put on hold, thinking 
a legislative action of Congress will solve this. And it didn't. So all the president is doing is the law. He stopped doing something illegal to do something legal. And for Nancy Pelosi to go on and on and on, you can't blame Donald Trump. And by the way, that's not the only thing he did. He also freed up all the different organizations to unite. So now all the fast food employees can lump together, change an actuary. So it's not the sickest and oldest and poorest all lumped together. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Where was I before I was so rudely interrupted by capitalism? I am Michael Del Giorno from Super Talk, 99.7 WTN in Nashville, Tennessee, as always, honored to sit in for Dr. Savage on the Savage Nation with you. Our phone number, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. You can follow all the stories we're going to eventually get to, maybe even a few will run out of time and not get to, at michaelsavage.com. And don't forget to pre-order his upcoming book. I've been waiting a long time for it, not much longer. It'll be out in November, God, Faith, and Reason, the latest from Dr. Michael Savage. All right, so I'm I'm making a simple point that... um, It's our job for those of us that are radio personalities, talk show hosts, or authors, or whatever else we are, to help you understand the day's news. That's In the essence, at the end of the day, um, I'm going to sift through everything that's out there. I'm going to pick the things you really need to know, make sure you really understand them, and hopefully along the way you kind of can anticipate what's coming next. Because ignorance and apathy is killing us. And as we discovered in our first hour, why no one's covering the wildfires, because, well, they don't fit a certain worldview or agenda. You want to make sure you are safe from that kind of dupability. I, I love being married, and I love having children. If nothing else, it keeps us all humble and grounded, right? So here I am, not that I think much of it, I just doing what I can to help Dr. Savage, who needs a day off because he's been choking in smoke. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't you know, ever cease being who I really am, which is a husband and a father. So even though I'm talking to 10, 15, 20 million of you, I get this text from home just a minute ago. Anna was cleaning out the mice cage. Annie, that's one of our cats, got Pixie in her mouth and tried to run off. And he had to go get her, slap her in the face to get Pixie out of her mouth. All right, well, no. That's a really bad news story for Pixie. But it's really not bad news, right? That's what cats do. The cat didn't do anything wrong. She was just being a cat. Heck, if, if, if you want a cat to give you the ultimate I love you, she'll kill that mouse, keep it in her mouth, and bring it to you. I love you this much. So I think the left would want you to believe today that Donald Trump is speeding up the sabotage of Obamacare. It's a terminal patient. Time is the only factor leading to its death. You can't sabotage something that has been self-set to implode. That's laughable. Or Nancy Pelosi suggesting, this is heartless. Hasn't he thought about this, read this, understood this? From the woman who said, we have to pass it before we can read it, let alone understand it. So I just want to make sure that you all understand what's going on. So there is a provision for payments, CSR payments, to the insurance companies that were never constitutionally the authority of an an executive president to enact. It is exactly what it sounds like. The executive branch executes. The legislative branch legislates, creates law and funds and pays for it. And the judicial branch, they sit and make sure nobody's gotten out of line. 
from our ultimate law and intent. Well, in this case, the judicial branch has spoken. The district court in D.C. And they said, no, this is not good. You don't have this power. How do we know that? Well, because the Republicans in the legislative branch sued and the, and, and the judicial branch upheld. And Obama just, you know, appealed. And then nobody did anything with the appeal thinking Congress would address. And it's just been sitting there. So all the president did, kind of like Annie, is be a cat. The president is going to be crucified now and criticized now for obeying the law. You see, it was the original act that was illegal. By the way, notice the word I chose, illegal. I know that doesn't mean much. We have a whole argument over borders, language, and culture because people can't understand the difference between a legal immigrant and an illegal immigrant. But what the president... Obama was doing, that was illegal. What President Trump is doing is legal. So is that bad news or good news? Now, of course, the left will also fill the narrative with how, oh, that's going to ruin it for everybody. See, I think it's good news. Let me give you another example. I am not a huge, huge discusser and fan of what the Republican Party and the president are trying to talk and call tax reform. I think it's a targeted cut. I think it's a smart thing to do. I mentioned Tulsa, Oklahoma. I started KFAQ, and that's how they're listening to Michael Savage right now. Station I started. Anybody from Oklahoma, they could take you for a ride and show you capitalism. You'll be driving on the turnpike. Notice it's a turnpike. Forever. Nothing. Fields. And you don't even need a welcome to Texas sign to know when you're in Texas because then just all of a sudden, poof. And you got to ask yourself, wow, a quarter mile and suddenly this soil apparently is better. (laughs) No, it's not the soil. Heck, they ran me out of town, but for decades I was talking about you got to have tort reform, you got to have workers' compensation reform, or people aren't going to do business here. They can go right across the border and do business and not pay this huge liability premium. You got state taxes, corporate tax rates that are out of line with your neighboring states. Why would somebody do their business there? They'll go right across the border like Texas and have no income tax for their employees. They're non-competitive. And so all President Trump is saying is we have very, very high corporate tax rates. And that's what's luring companies away. Not to Texas, out of the country. This will help bring them back. And when they come back, the hiring and the building and the manufacturing and the workers will be here. This is good news, not bad news. Now, the only thing I would say critical is you are missing a noble, valuable discussion that we really should be having. Because I don't want to think lowering a a a corporate rate here or taking away two deductions in order to lower a rate here flat. That's not tax reform. You don't achieve tax reform until you have the moral, principled discussion. Let me me help out a friend here. Maybe one of the best books you've never read. William Federer, F-E-D-E-R-E-R. William Federer, The History of Taxation. You should read it. You'll be in awe. I don't know if you just assumed there was always taxation, but there wasn't. In fact, we fought to be free from. And we got in a little war. We needed some cash. So we had a 1% tax. Temporary. And then it went away after the war. And then we had another war. So we did another temporary tax, and then it never went away. And then it just grew and it grew and it grew into a completely different animal. So outside our constitutional intent. There's another thing you need to wake up to, and that is that there is a a sin of envy in America. What is rich? What is poor? You know what it finally gets defined as? Anybody that's got a penny more than me is rich. Because we're envious. And you need to know there's a difference between envy and jealousy. Jealousy is just like, gosh, I like your house better. Wow, your wife stayed in good shape. Wow, that car is great. 
Envy is you have something that belongs to me, and if I can't have it, you can't have it either. I'll destroy it for everyone. That's the spirit that the left is working in. That's why their goal is so often confused with the destruction of America as we know it. It's driven by a fuel of a spirit, envy. I love the way John F. Kennedy did it. I think John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan modeled it. George W. Bush kind of did it, but didn't really model it and really wasn't the kind of eloquent spokesperson in order to really carry it out. And then he outspent to take away the effect. But John F. Kennedy was the first one to stop and say, whoa, time out. As we're entering this big recession. Let me tell you right now, this may seem opposite of common sense, but now is the time to lower taxes, not raise them. What do you mean not raise them? We're going into a recession. The government needs money. You've got to raise taxes. It's the only way government gets money. Uh, no. And Kennedy understood something. He understood that it was ultimately a moral question, a moral question we don't even ask anymore, a principled question we don't even ask anymore. So the first thing Kennedy explained is when you listen to me right now in the Savage Nation, when you go to work and you get a paycheck, that's your money morally. It's not the government's and then they give you back what you get to keep. That's your money. All of it. Every last penny. The government needs to look you in the eye and say morally, that's your money. And they never do. They believe it's theirs. They take as much as they'd like. They're always wanting more and they never say thank you. But it's morally yours. And Kennedy said it. The next thing he said is, I trust you in how you will spend it. In fact, if anything, I mistrust government and how it will spend it, but I trust you. This money that I allow you to keep, I, A, believe it's morally yours, and B, trust how you'll spend it. And as you spend it, businesses will grow, and as businesses grow, they'll hire, and as they hire, more taxpayers, burden less, even funds government more, let alone grows an economy right out of a recession into recovery and into prosperity. Amazing how doing morally right, principally right, ends up working for everybody. But that's not what we like anymore. We have built our whole system on picking winners and losers. Look, you only tax for two reasons. To collectively fund what you can't fund individually. Or to discourage or encourage a certain behavior. Well, I don't have to explain to you and I'd have to write a book or point you to books that can explain it even better. But our whole system is, you know what, backwards. We reward failure, we penalize success. I love to watch small businesses. When they're small, there's there's stories that Democrat presidents would tell during a State of the Union address. Judy was down on her luck. She just lost her husband, didn't have a home or anything to do, but she had an idea. And she created a business, and now she employs 17. (sighs) But if Judy's idea ever got national wind, and she became a large, successful corporation, she'd be the devil herself. (laughs) Incarnate. All success is evil. All poverty is noble. We don't have any idea how they got poor. Maybe they were drunks. Maybe they were drug addicts. Maybe they were abusers. Maybe they were lazy. Maybe just kept giving them stuff for free. They never learned the principle of earning it. So everything we do now rewards failure and penalizes success. And we wonder why we have more failure. But it is, in essence, picking and choosing winners and losers. And it has created two classes, I think, that are relevant. Taxpayers and tax receivers. And the receivers don't care. They just want more and more for free, and they're not saying thank you, and they're never satisfied. And then the payers, well, we start fighting amongst ourselves. Well, you got more to give than me. No, you got more to give. Yeah, but you don't understand where I live. Well, I live here. No, you don't have meaningful tax reform. First of all, if you were interested in meaningful tax reform, you'd go to a fair tax, period. End of story. It's so simple. Why wouldn't you? It can't help but take care of itself and manage its own fairness. But going in and tweaking these two deductions in favor of lowering this bracket for this group and raising that bracket for that group, you're still in the immoral business of pretending it's your money and not morally theirs. And if anybody else did it, it'd be called theft, punishable by imprisonment. 
You're still picking and choosing winners and losers. You still think it's your more right and your money, and it's not. And you're still not trusting us to spend it because you think you spend it better. You care more. You can meet the needs of the poor better. None of which is true. So as far as Trump goes and what we're discussing now, hey, maybe the political explanation is it's what they can get done. Just don't ever conflate it or confuse it with reform. Something we still desperately need somebody with a big brain and a big eloquent voice to address once and for all and convince the American people. This is a targeted tax cut. Smart, good, but it's not better or best and it's not reform. More in a moment on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. It's a valid question for uh, all the producers back in Dallas. What would have gotten me more in trouble with Dr. Savage? Slipping into prayer on accident last hour over the fires? Or if I play a clip of John F. Kennedy? I'm not certain. Um, I'm Michael Del Jordan for Dr. Savage on the Savage Nation. Um, you know, I, I was just commenting on, uh, I don't think this is tax reform by any stretch. It may be all that you can get done with this Congress. I mean, we're dealing with not only uh, Democrats, but establishment Republican empty suit uh, power mongrels. Uh, but what we do lack in America today is a president like John F. Kennedy, who has the brains and the capitalism and the eloquence to explain to the American people that when you when you go earn a paycheck, that's morally your money, not the government's. And the government should and it must trust how you spend it. And as you spend it, businesses will grow. And as you grow, they will they'll hire and more taxpayers burden less is the only proper way to fund government. We've proved it three times now through Kennedy, through Reagan, and through W. Bush. But let's not conflate or confuse anything that is being discussed right now. And it's a very confusing argument. I'm going to take these two deductions away, and then we're going to transfer to this rate over here, and then we're going to raise that rate over here. You know what Kennedy said? It's morally your money. Principally, I trust how you'll spend it. You'll spend it better than government. And that's why immediate to take away any uncertainty, because there's no bigger killer to an economy than uncertainty. Immediate, across the board, top to bottom, everyone and everything, individuals, families, companies, reduced. What could be more fair? What could be more capitalistic? What could be more historically proven? That's not what we're getting. So we're getting a targeted tax cut. For corporations. It's a step in the right direction, but it's not reform. And it's a long way from a fair tax. Why, if we had one, I could afford private school for my kids instantly. As I always tell my wife, it's not that I can't afford my kids. I can't afford everyone else's. President is doing right, though, on Obamacare, and I'll explain that next on the Savage Nation. Thanks for joining us. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282-SAVAGE. This is the Savage Nation. I'm Michael Del Jordan for Dr. Savage. He'll be back on Monday. The phone number 855-400-SAVAGE. Uh, things that are going on today. Uh, I, will, I, I have to admit, you know, at some point, um, I am a big fan of, because there's a difference between, you know, somebody who's in the business of investigating crimes and a conspiracy theorist. A conspiracy theorist has a theory and then goes, tries to find facts that will collaborate that theory. Whereas an investigator just follows the facts without theory and sees where they they lead them. And I I believe in the immediate hours to give patience. You know, let investigators do their job. But, you know, when we come up a week, week and a half later, and now suddenly didn't check check in on September 28th, but September 25th, I'm like, you know, come on, go to the front desk. How do you get that wrong? 
than the whole timeline, right? Oh, they were remarkable. That's why we released the body cams. You could see how remarkable law enforcement was to get there in 10 minutes. And then the security guard got shot. And then the shooting stopped. And then they waited for SWAT. And because the room could be booby-trapped, they entered the room 72 minutes later. All right, that all, that all made sense. But there's a tremendous loss of trust and credibility when later you have to say, and things can change, but they shouldn't be things like when he checked in. Now suddenly the guy's shot before any shots are fired on the concert goers. Now there was people up and down that hall, we know, because law enforcement told us they cleared up and down that hall. That's what took them 72 minutes before they could enter the room. You have 200 rounds fired down your hallway in a hotel. Someone's going to call 911. Now that 10 minutes isn't so remarkable. There's already conspiracy theorists blaming the Illuminati and everything else. I mean, you know, and it's going to, you know. And you wonder, I mean, to this day, the Kennedy assassination is a great example. You still have those who don't believe. It has been forensically, scientifically reenacted. There was nothing magic about the bullet. Kennedy was higher and offset. You just didn't understand how the limousine was set up. The trajectory, the ability to shoot, the fact that he was a Marine marksman. You see, at the end of the day, nobody wanted to believe one schmo like Lee Harvey Oswald could take out somebody so beloved and a leader of the free world, but he did. But to this day, you have conspiracy theories, theorists that will find little things. Now, if you talk to them honestly about any other subject, they go, oh, yeah, you can have echoes. Oh, yeah, this, you know. But they won't let go of it. And you wonder if someday there'll be never an ability for anybody to let go of a conspiracy here because how they've handled this investigation. Well, you say, well, it can't get any worse, right? Well, how about the security guard who was shot by Stephen Paddock in the moments leading up to the worst mass shooting in U.S. history? Set to break his silence Thursday night with a five-minute interview. One on Fox News. And then he mysteriously disappears and doesn't show up. You're begging! You're begging for the conspiracy theorist. Now, we know that it was incendiary bullets. We knew that they pounded out two windows. One was facing the fuel tanks with incendiary bullets. The other was facing the stage and the concert goers. Was there one shooter? Was there two shooters? Did they really intend to get out alive? Is that why a fire door was jammed at the security guard first? I, I don't know. I just know for all the FBI... And for all of the sheriff's department and all the investigations, I mean, by now you should have been through all of his phones, all of his computers. You should have looked at every video. I guess that's how you figured out he was there on the 25th. You start seeing him on the 25th in the videos, but they got to do a better job of communicating. They're losing my trust fast. I want to be the first to say the San Juan mayor. She's kind of getting on my nerves. When Trump's there, she's kissing her, his butt. She can't be more grateful. America couldn't be doing more. And that's after before he gets there bashing him. And now that he's gone, she's bashing him again. I will say this out loud. I know that the left is going to portray the president as heartless. Far from it. And very generous with funding. Whether it's in the wake of the hurricanes in Texas or Florida or to the Virgin Islands or to Puerto Rico. But a president has a right to say, let me say it, let me, let me say it away the president hasn't said it. You know, a lot of people used to like to talk about the cost of the Gulf War. And I used to try to make the distinction between the cost of the Afghan War, the cost of the Iraqi War, and the cost of rebuilding our military because a previous president had deleted it recklessly. And nobody can ever make that distinction. I'll look you in the eye today and say, how much are we paying to help victims in Puerto Rico, and how much are we paying to rebuild Puerto Rico from things that happened before the storm? And anybody who is honest about this, you can, you can write the checks, you can send the resources. That's why we sent military to help with distribution. It was getting there, and it couldn't get from the port to the people. There's a lot of problems in Puerto Rico. And they're no more to be blamed on Donald Trump, quite frankly. Well, then Nancy Pelosi blaming Obamacare on Donald Trump when he didn't create it. She did. 
But uh, the $36.5 billion that is needed to replenish the funds that have been depleted because of the hurricanes, Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico, overwhelmingly passed 353 to 69. Um, president did make the comment, we can't remain in Puerto Rico forever with, with, with federal emergency officials. I mean, P- Puerto Rico eventually has to, you know, be able to get beyond emergency and re-care for its people. It's amazing how the left has no problem when they're arguing wars, especially when they're making the case to leave a theater before it's appropriate, as they did Iraq and Afghanistan. But I guess, you know, they don't, they, they don't want us to be a police state, but they certainly want us to be a care state. Look, we all love these people. And America and this president and this legislature has certainly funded and is certainly doing. There are obviously some other systemic problems in Puerto Rico that they'll have to rise above. The other breaking kind of story is on the NFL. I I, I can't even look you in the eye and I do this for a living. I don't even know what they're at. I I don't even know what they're up to or where they're at. I don't know if they've decided to reinstate. I'll, I'll tell you, the worst news I could give the NFL today is if anybody were to call 855-400-SAVAGE and ask me, hey, what did the Eagles and the Panthers do last night? I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know because I didn't care, and I wouldn't know because I didn't watch. I was watching the Cubs and the Nationals. So now we find out that maybe or maybe not they're going to reinstate this. Now you have a couple of outspoken owners. I mean, the same Jerry Jones who locked arms with his players against the president is now locking arms with the American people and saying, uh, look, there's, you know, I've tried it both ways. Supporting the players, supporting the country, and... You know, when it comes to the flag, that's got to be the priority. Whether it's Jerry Jones, whether it's the NFL, dancing around, walking up to but not committing. They still think this is about Donald Trump and it isn't. Number one. In the end, it's a tragic irony for them. All the president had ever said was, if these owners would make them stand for the national anthem or not play, this would stop. Isn't it the conclusion the NFL's finally gotten to, even though we can't get Goodell to admit it now? It, it, it does bring up a teachable moment, a historic kind of teachable moment. Baseball went through this, and I think it was the beginning of the end of America being our pastime. Because most Americans were going through a really tough time and working very hard, and these people making an awful lot of money were on strike. and They didn't care. And then baseball fans didn't care. Now, you could make a case that Cal Ripken in an amazing run kind of got us back in love a little bit. But I think irreparably baseball was harmed. And I think up until a couple of months ago, it was no longer America's pastime. Football was. But with an amazing playoff going on right now, hockey season beginning, plenty of college football to watch. I don't think they know what they're dealing with. Might be ironic, but football may hand baseball back its status as America's pastime. I don't know that everything will ever get back to normal. Now, how does it get normal when it gets dysfunctional in life? You really blow it, you really admit it, and you ask for forgiveness. Well, football, its owners, its management, its you know league, its players have not said that. I'll give you another example, too. I can't think of one person in my 53 years of living who came to me and sincerely asked for my forgiveness that I didn't give. You know why? I need a lot of forgiveness. So I give a lot of forgiveness. That doesn't mean I always continue the relationship. It's a good lesson for you ladies out there listening. You got a man physically harming you. He may ask you for forgiveness after every time he beats you up. Forgive him. Doesn't mean stay with them. Doesn't mean allow them to stay in the house. And in the end, that's what's going to happen to football. First of all, they got to rise up, look us in the eye and go, you know what? There was no injustice with Michael Brown. Black Lives Matter is a thug organization. We did allow a Colin Kaepernick problem to become a league-wide problem, and we did disrespect your nation. We disrespected the men and women who fought and died for your nation, and we've disrespected every man and woman in uniform that serves and protects in law enforcement. And we were wrong, and we ask you to forgive us. They're not saying anything remotely like that. 
And once they do that, I may forgive them, but that doesn't mean I'm ever going to think about them the same, watch them the same, shop the same, or have the same relationship again. They may have gone irreparably too far. But I think they think that they can just move on quietly and everything's going to be okay. Well, I got to tell you something. That's not normal for me on a Thursday night. And that was a pretty good matchup, a pair of four and one teams, I might add. I didn't even flick over to see the score of the Eagles and the Panthers. And I'm a 53-year-old lifetime fan. Let alone, what do you think the odds are I'm buying tickets for the Titans game anytime soon? Or a New Jersey? Or a hat? Or a fat head for a wall? I don't think football knows what it's done. And if they wait much longer, not sure that forgiveness is going to be perceived very credible or sincere. They better ask for forgiveness. They better admit they were wrong, and then they better cross their fingers and their legs and hope and pray that we still want to have a relationship with them. But that's where we're at now. I could give you the whole story, but it's... They're not going to just drift out of this mess. And they better wake up to that like it was yesterday. We do have a lot of, you know, we got a playmate now that was groped. That, that expands it now to Oliver Stone, a different director from Harvey Weinstein, you know, uh, a, a theater uh, film executive. Uh, it went quickly to Matt, you know, to uh, not Matt Damon, but Ben Affleck. This is spreading. I think there were, and there still will be, but there were some early kind of trying to make this a man thing. Literally on The View, the suggestion was, it's kind of like um, P. Diddy. His solution for the racism problem in the NFL is go start their own league. Great idea. But what's the tragedy? The tragedy is that I was born in 1964, and I started noticing and really remembering things about 1970. Do you know that 9 out of 10 of my heroes growing up were African American, people of color? I didn't know the story of when they couldn't get a drink out of a fountain, couldn't eat in a restaurant, couldn't sit anywhere on a bus, couldn't play on a baseball team, couldn't play on a football team. I never knew it existed. And they were already my heroes. Can you imagine P. Diddy thinks that the big solution is, let's go back to that exact same thing, only let's do it in a different color, and that's the solution? It's still racism, you moron. They were suggesting on The View, this is why women should only be bosses. Only women should be executives. Oh, great idea. Except you're sexist. And ignoring that women can be just. Just as sexual harassing as men. After all, you've told us for years, it's not about sex, it's about power. They don't know the difference between harassment and rape. But they better wake up and learn it, because they got it in Harvey Weinstein. And they better not try to make this an American corporate problem because that fits their narrative. This is a Hollywood problem. And it's a really big dilemma for the left because it's caught them in immediate hypocrisies. How they treated Trump versus how they're treating Harvey. And you know the Saturday Night Live analogy. It's a New York thing. Well, so was Trump, but that didn't stop you. I think one of our greatest quotes, and I'll share it with you when we come back, is Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda, who does two remarkable things. One, the first person to admit, we all knew he was this and did nothing. You're a fraud. And you're only discussing it in outrage now because it's in the news. But you hid it from being in the news and you allowed it to happen for decades. And yes, as only Jane can do, she still has the gall to make it about Trump. We'll continue through our top five stories of the day next on The Savage Nation. Don't move. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Welcome 
Welcome back into the Savage Nation. I'm Michael Del Giorno from Nashville, Tennessee. Honored to be in for Dr. Savage on the Savage Nation. 855-400-SAVAGE is the phone number. We only have a minute. I, I did want to kind of conclude my thoughts on this whole Harvey. The three questions I hear the most concerning Harvey Weinstein. Why is everybody coming out now? Well, haven't you ever heard there's safety in numbers? It happens every time. All right, so as one comes out, the other one feels more comfortable than the other one. Now you're getting all kinds of mixed people coming. Now they're going to spill the beans about everything. Uh, there's a difference. What Harvey Weinstein was doing is rape. It's criminal. This guy belongs in jail, not just out of the business. Versus something that is unwarranted or immoral. I mean, what he was doing was illegal. Dams break and things start flowing. But what it's proving for them is they have an industry problem, yes, but they have a credibility problem. They didn't treat Weinstein the same as they treated Trump, and that's obvious. And if they were truly outraged over this issue, it would have applied the same for both. But what's worse is how they've known all along. See, that leads to my one great gifting. I know the difference between being sorry and caught because I'm a father. Jane Fonda's our loser of the day next on The Savage Nation. I'll prove it. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE-SAVAGE. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Oh, for a minute, I thought I got a Hall of Fame award. I got all excited. I'm Michael Del Giorno. No awards. Nashville, Tennessee, filling in for Dr. Savage. Honored to be in the Savage Nation with you today. 855-400-7282 is the phone number. 855-400-SAVAGE. To follow all our stories that we've kind of gotten to, may not get to, go to michaelsavage.com. And don't forget to pre-order his upcoming book. It'll be out in November. He's been working on it, and a lot of us have been waiting for a long time. God, Faith, and Reason. Three things America desperately needs to remember. Pre-order your book uh, today at michaelsavage.com. Um, I'm going to call this segment the sounds of the day, although ultimately I'm shamelessly getting to uh, Jane Fonda. Well, I'm going to give what I call the P. Diddy Loser of the Day Award. Uh, but before that, I want to play. I want to start with John Kelly, who had his big news conference yesterday. And I don't know if Michael covered it live while that was happening. Uh, but this was the one section of it. By the way, the, the reporters loved him from the front row to the back to back at headquarters. Even Brooke, the miserable one on CNN, even she was charmed by it. I mean, we, I think we finally found in this administration someone everyone can agree on and love. And it's Chief of Staff John Kelly. Here's what he said yesterday. I would just offer to you that uh, although I read it all the time, uh, pretty consistently, I I'm not quitting today. Uh, I, I don't believe, and I just talked to the president, I don't think I'm being fired today. And uh, I am not so frustrated in this job that uh, I'm thinking of leaving. I would tell you this is the hardest job I've ever had. Uh, this is, in my view, the most important job I ever had. So uh, unless things change, I'm not... Um, quitting i'm not getting fired and uh, i don't think i'll fire anyone tomorrow there was a great quote that came up later in the news conference that i loved somebody asked him what frustrates the president the most and he didn't bat an eye and they were still loving him as he was doing this but he didn't bat an eye. he goes well for one you all he's very frustrated in the things that you report that aren't true that you don't even verify you don't even ask for a quote on we could help you uh, what frustrates him? Uh, we hate you. And then they still like, oh, you're so funny. Oh, my God. He's, he's so honest and frank. I'm telling you, the White House has stumbled on finally its media darling, and it's John Kelly, one of our sounds of the day. The next is Donald Trump, and I want to share a personal story from my local show today. But first, I want you to hear clip two, Donald Trump. We have made great strides against ISIS. Tremendous strides. I don't know if you've seen what's going on, but tremendous strides against ISIS. 
They never got hit like this before. <laughs> but they've been just ruthless, and they've ruthlessly slaughtered innocent Christians, along with the vicious killing of innocent Muslims and other religious minorities. And we've made their lives very, very difficult. We've done more against ISIS in nine months than the previous administration's done during its whole administration. By far. By far. I love the quote um, in terms of, you know, the focus, if you will. There's a lot of breathing. There's a lot of pausing. There's a lot of just kind of like, you know, small talk. They've got never gotten hit like this before. This is, believe me, they're going through a very difficult time. I wish a president would just look people in the eye and say, um, I had uh, Dr. Salman Hussein from Iraq on my show today. He happens to be in Nashville. He's going to be speaking. This guy is an extraordinary conversion story. And by the way, here's a guy that when he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, as we say in cultural Christianity, he was instantly, I mean, the guy was healed. First of all, he was appalled. A Christian wanted to pray for him and touch him. But he was healed of cancer. And he literally woke up the next morning, and these giant tumors are all gone. And he converts to Christianity, and he is immediately, I mean, he was given three months to live from cancer, then he gets healed by God of cancer, and then he's got about like one day to live, because he's a Kafir officially, and an apostate. But, you know, he looked me in the eye, and he said something very simple, you know, because I mean, my curiosity is what's going on in the ground, you know, what are you, what are you guys experiencing? This is an individual who saw his brother decapitated on his front lawn, killed for associating with a Christian. This guy's seen a lot of stuff. And he said, well, I don't think anything would summarize it more than telling you that last year when I was sitting with you, 30% of my country was controlled by ISIS. Today, 1% of my country. Now, as I heard that quote from the president, I'm thinking to myself, somebody give this guy, you know, a quote. When the president tells you he's done more in nine months than the previous administration had done in years, he ain't whistling Dixie. And there's a, a teachable moment here. You identify an enemy. You call it what it is evil. And you destroy it. You don't contain it. You destroy it. And they've been destroyed. In nine months to give you a stat to go along with the president's small talk, because it's really big talk. ISIS has gone from controlling a third of Iraq to controlling 1% of Iraq. And they're literally surrendering and on the run. And they're losing their credibility as a caliphate. Now, that does open the door to a new vacuum, and who will fill that? And trust me, Iran isn't done trying to fill that. Donald Trump is right to point out to everybody. He had a different vision of this war. He prioritized what his commanders and his generals were telling him. He made them an enemy with the goal of victory and destruction, and it's working. Not that anybody in the media will tell you about it. (sighs) Jane Fonda. I kind of teased this topic um, because I'm a father. And being a father makes me an expert on one particular subject. And that is the difference between when someone is sorry or when someone is caught. Now, a couple of parents out there might have giggled, but let me tell you something. There's no more graphic view. Until I had children 13 years ago, I could talk about this stuff, but I really didn't get it. I have watched kids at every stage, every age, and every disobedient action. Let me tell you something. You look at you look at it from a quality standpoint or a quantity standpoint. What amazes me, and they're no worse than me. I was the same way, but I can't for the life of me brainstorm one example of all my kids I thought were genuinely sorry. They're always just sorry they got caught. They're never genuinely sorry. So I'm an expert at this. And what Hollywood has been caught up in, thanks to Harvey Weinstein, is a Hollywood problem. And it's more than just a men in power and sexual assault problem. It's a moral bankruptcy and crisis. Let me repeat that. I know it's an old school tactic, but in case nobody has made these points crystal clear to you, this is a Hollywood problem. 
And it's one that goes beyond sexual assault and or harassment. It is revealing of a moral, deep-rooted problem. Why do I say that? Because they're all just sorry they got caught. They're not sorry. The same people that were crucifying Trump were hiding, aiding, and abetting this man. The same people speaking out against it today, well, they don't even control their words enough to hide from you that they've known all along and did nothing and went on award shows and referred to him as God, among other things. It shows that they're an intellectual, principled, moral fraud. Now, this shouldn't surprise you. Most of them are uneducated, and all of them are moral relativists. In other words, they don't believe in truth, let alone possess one. All they're capable of is agenda, or as they do for a living, repeating a talking point like it's a script. But what have they revealed to America? Well, why weren't you this outraged over Bill Clinton, and why do you still worship Bill Clinton? What did Harvey Weinstein do that Bill Clinton didn't do? Not just physically, but in terms of destroying people if they talked. Oh, so it's evil when Trump says it, but it's not evil when Clinton does it. And that makes you have to kind of look at two decades, and that's a little bit for the ADD American people. But you can't miss that you just spent, I mean, if you're CNN, CNN for about a four-day period of time just kept playing that clip on the bus with Billy Bush over and over again, over and over again, over and over again. They didn't care if my kids accidentally overheard it over and over again. They didn't care how many times they said the P word over and over and over and over. How many people have played you the Harvey Weinstein clip? I played it for my audience. This big, fat, monster, disgusting slob. That was the voice of a madman, a bully, a rapist, a nut. You know, I watch probably far less Fox even than you might imagine. I don't see anybody playing that tape over and over again. You see, if Hollywood was sincere about Donald Trump and sincere about women, as I am, I have two daughters. I said to the guys off the air, probably should be careful saying this on a national show, but what the heck, I am me. I can't believe he had the gall to go after Mia Sorvino. That's Paul Sorvino's daughter. Paul's connected. He's lucky he's alive. Why did nobody punch him out? Why didn't Brad Pitt, after he treated his girlfriend, you treat my wife a certain way, you're going to meet me. And one's going to the hospital and one's going to jail. But what it proves is how bankrupt their morals are, how insincere they are, incapable of real principles and outrage. They only know agenda and they only know talking points like scripts. They're not sorry. They're sorry they got caught. Oh, you need proof? Jane Fonda, ladies and gentlemen. We have to be helped by men. It's important to know that not all men are predators. There are well, good you. men and the good men have to stand up and defend us and and embody other ways of being. We have to believe the women who come forward. We have to speak out. I found out about Harvey about a year ago, and I'm ashamed that I didn't say anything right then. Isn't it amazing how they they don't even know not to say that? But every one of them are guilty of this. Whether it's Meryl Streep, no matter matter who comes forward, they're all guilty. We've all known this. There's not a waiter and waitress that didn't know this. There isn't anybody at his office, including human resources, that didn't know this. There's not an actor or actress that didn't know this. And nobody ever spoke, and everybody always hit it. Saturday Night Live hit it. That's ah, a New York thing. you got to remind him, Donald Trump's from New York. Oh. You see, they're pure political. They were never sincere about women. And they're outraged towards a predator. It was just politics. It was always about Hillary versus Trump. Do they even realize the loss of credibility they've suffered? Do they even realize how naked they stand before us right now? And nobody's groping. We're all puking. Like the Wizard of Oz with the curtain pulled back. We can see them for what they are. 
frauds, morally bankrupt hypocrites. But of course, Jane had to make it about Trump, too. That's next on The Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. not having half as much fun as I am. I am Michael Del Giorno from Music City, USA, and Super Talk 99.7 WTN, shameless plug in Nashville. Uh, honored to be filling in for Dr. Savage here with you on the Savage Nation. Michael will be back on Monday. Of course, his book, God, Faith, and Reason, comes out in November, never too early to pre-order, and you can find that and all the top stories heading into the weekend at michaelsavage.com. So I'm about Harvey Weinstein, and, and again, I, I think that this is... Um, The left has tried to make this an American problem. All men are animals. All men are pigs. All men are doing this. I don't know any of them. In fact, I can't tell. The view was suggesting that perhaps the solution is that we have all male bosses. Well, I have a female boss. So, you know, I'm already there. But what it reveals is Hollywood has a problem. They have a moral problem. They have a principal value problem. Because they didn't treat Harvey the same way they treated Trump. Nobody had nobody lacked the courage to come out against Trump, did they? And nobody, including Jane Fonda, admits, oh, I knew about Harvey, and I'm ashamed I didn't say anything. Well, you should be. Because if you were truly, authentically outraged over the treatment of women, that's all it would have taken. You just proved you're political. You're not outraged when it's Clinton, because he's your guy, with your worldview and your lack of values. You are outraged when it's Trump because he's not your guy and he doesn't represent your worldview. And he represents a part of America that you live off of and despise every day. It shows how unauthentic, or as I say as a parent, and I have proven thoroughly, they're not sorry. They're sorry they got caught. But they got to make it about Trump too. And when we come back, I'll play you the loser of the day quote from Jane Fonda. She'll get the P. Diddy Loser of the Day Award. And then I want to address something that I think is my favorite story of the day. Actually, we, get, we have time to do Jane now, don't we? I think we do. Yeah, let's do it. Let's finish up with Jane and honor her as our loser of the day. So she makes the comment, I knew about Weinstein. I didn't say anything, and I'm ashamed. Well, you should be. But just to prove that they are all about partisan politics and not morals, values, and beliefs and true feminism, she goes on to say this. Donald Trump is, uh, we have a man who is president who does these things. And what is, what kind of a message does that say? Unfortunately, that counteracts a lot of the good that we're doing because a lot of men see, well, our president does it. And he got elected even after people discovered that he was an abuser. So I'm just going to go ahead and do what I want to do. It's unacceptable. And we can't ever forget that, and we have to stand up to them. What a moron, right? I'll remind Jane that Bill Clinton not only did it, he was reelected to a second term. How come she didn't choose him as her analogy? He even perjured himself and obstructed justice, as his wife would later perfect. Boy, you talk about a pivot, huh? Nobody noticed Weinstein. Nobody noticed Weinstein. No, nobody noticed the Hollywood bankruptcy of morals. And don't notice Jane, who's remained silent. Let me point you right back. And by the way, Donald Trump did everything consensual. And that's not the case with Weinstein. Jane Fonda, our loser of the day on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. It's amazing how professional I am. I can be arguing with the producers in Dallas over the garbage Houston Astros. uh, And then make the transition right back to the Savage Nation. Cubs have made it 
Back to law. It's deja vu all over again. Three years in a row, we'll have the Cubs and the Dodgers, and then we're going to have the Astros and the Yankees, or as my wife says, are those new matte black helmets for the Yankees? I like their outfits. I hope your team wins. Um, You know, I want to finish with my favorite uh, two stories of the week. Um, One has got to be Amazon. You know, I I know we live in kind of a backwards world now where, um, you know, it used to be when I was growing up, the goal was not to be followed. You know, you're watching a movie. Somebody's always paranoid looking in the rearview mirror or walking down the street, looking in the reflections. Somebody following me. The goal is not to be followed. Now, all of a sudden, everybody wants to be followed. I want to start a website. Not Twitter, not this, not that called. Leave me alone. Left alone. Um, But, you know, there's just like these strange reverse obsessions. And I think what happens is, is I think this technology kind of makes us. I was looking at a picture that somebody put on Facebook the other day. And it's her dressed in like a negligee in a hotel next to a bed. And I'm thinking, who would have gone to Kodak and printed that and sent it to all their friends? Why is it because we have Facebook, they think they want to see us right before, you know, they spend intimate time with their husband. I I don't want to see that. And so I think, you know, there's this notion about technology. And, you know, if technology works, great. It doesn't always. Let me tell you something. This filling in for Michael Savage is a much different situation. If I get to fly to San Francisco... Or New York every time I do it. But now with technology, what do I do? Two shifts in the same building with the same homeless guy looking at me out the window. Technology has changed. Is it better? Yeah, I guess. You're not limited to whoever's in the building to fill in. Or whoever pays for fill-ins doesn't have to fly in hotel and so on. But the latest from Amazon is this. Someone in a boardroom at Amazon said, look, it's not enough that we're hovering over their homes with drones. Uh, Apparently, it's not enough that, you know, we simply leave the package on the doorstep and it's waiting for you. Yeah, but somebody could steal it or could get wet in the rain. All right. My idea at the boardroom would have been, how about we put the package in a plastic bag? In fact, we can sell the space on the plastic bag to advertisers. Okay. No, their idea is, They think we want them to open our door and put the package in our home. And they think they want us to open our trunk and put the package in the trunk of our car. I find this laughable, right? I don't have anybody in my house. Oh, you can trust the Amazon guy. (laughs) Honey, is that you? Oh, no, it's me, man. I got your package. Oh, yeah, put it down. I mean, when did we, I, I cannot to this day, and I know this is going to probably upset some people. I can't believe you're getting in cars with strangers. I mean, I could never pronounce the name of my taxi driver, nor the country he came from, or understand a thing he was saying. But at least this picture was there on a license. The car was painted. At least I knew what I was getting into. Now people are just getting in with strangers. I mean, even Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, I presume, drove a domestic vehicle. How would you know it's not him? Now we're going to have strangers coming into our homes. Makes no sense whatsoever. Then comes Motorola. Remember when Motorola was a big name? Now I, I don't know what our, you know, uh, iPhone is probably, I would assume, the leader or Samsung or LG. Who's still walking around with Motorola? I, I haven't seen a Motorola phone since it was like a walkie-talkie in a World War II movie. <laughs> Robert Robert in Dallas still has a Motorola and a picture of Nolan Ryan as its face cover. <laughs> Motorola has announced they're going back to their iconic flip phone. 60 bucks. Now, I was just at the Sprint store the other day, and I can't make sense of this 10. I can't. I can't figure out why I'm paying a grand, and nobody that works there can tell me why I'm paying a grand, so I ended up doing the eight. I can't figure out what the 10 has that the 8 doesn't, and one was way cheaper than the other. I went with that. But I've never, ever had the urge to go back to the flip phone. And I presume with the flip phone, and I don't want to put Robert's mic on, he'll probably get in trouble, but... I mean, are you back to texting with the three letters like we used to do? Remember those people that were like crazy one-finger wonders? You got to double-click a letter twice to get to the letter you want? And that's just one letter, let alone a word that is finished. So, and people are loving it. Isn't it amazing? Amazon's trying to get in our trunk and house, and I'm like, no way. Motorola's saying, let's go back with the crummy phone that passed us by. 
and they're having success. Now, this is what's funny. The flip phone, it's going to sell for $66. It'll be available next month. It's going to be called the Blade. It has the flip open screen. After that, it's believe it or not, and I know this is shocking to a lot of people, it's just a phone. Now, who the heck wants a phone that's just a phone anymore, right? When I open up my phone, phone? It's my home email. It's my work email. It's my phone. It's my texting. It's my social media. It's my bank account. It's my 401k. It's my stocks. It's the weather. It's my camera. It's my movies. I don't have to get out a projector. My entire home movies are in here. It's every game and video game I own. Why, you don't know it, but two segments ago, I rolled a guy in Moscow in Bowling King as I was talking to you. But is, is there a market for somebody to just get a phone? I guess we're going to find out. This is what's laughable. They're trying to sell it, right? So they go, well, it's a phone. Yeah, what else? Well, I mean, it's just a phone. It, um, it does have an alarm and a calculator. By the way, the alarm and calculator are the only two things I don't use on my phone. You can't get Facebook, you can't get Instagram, you can't get Twitter. There's only one game on it, and it's Tetris. It's like going back to Atari compared to to X1. But you know what the chairman says? People are wanting to get away from social media. They're wanting to get away from all this stuff. Wouldn't it be hilarious if the only way you could just go back to having a phone would be all the way back to Motorola? I guess when we get sick of all these channels... We'll go all the way back to an RCA console. It'll be interesting to see how this does. Uh, Amazon, you need to go back to the boardroom. I don't want anybody in my house. And certainly not with technology that a a criminal and a hacker is going to figure out how to get in before your own employee can. But I'll be watching the Razor flip phone. The Blade, $66. And what is it? Just a phone. Now to my favorite story of the day. One of the things that they like to do with Donald Trump is whisper campaigns. Now, listen, by and large, for the for the very overt attacks and outward attacks, I see people acting just as crazy as they did when Obama was in office. And I used to be the same person going, uh, he's not an idiot. He's not leading from behind. He's leading out in front of and on behalf of our enemies and anarchist organizations. Did anybody read the ingredients and stop looking at the cereal box cover? But I saw people reacting crazy to him. I like to think we weren't nearly as bad as the left is. The left has gone so far as to lose track of, oh, they have a different worldview than me. They have a different political platform than me. Oh, they disagree on what the solution is. They prioritize things different. All right, so they just, they disagree. But the left never assumes that, right? Like Jane Fonda's quote that made her the loser of the day. That's ridiculous. Donald Trump never went around raping anybody. Donald Trump bragged about what women allow him to do because he's a celebrity, but it, there was no inclination that it was unwanted. In that tape with Harvey Weinstein, you'll hear the word no about 72 times in 60 seconds. And he does it anyway. And if they speak, he destroys them. In some cases, against their will and overpowers them and rapes them. You can't compare that to what Donald Trump said on the bus with Billy Bush. Nor could you prove it. Look, if that's the case, you'd have arrested my entire freshman year class. Because they were all bragging about stuff they did on Friday night that I know they didn't. But there's a difference between consensual and rape. Celebrity and harassment. But with Donald Trump, what I'm fascinated with and what very people ever talk to you about are the little whisper campaigns. They don't just say, well, he has a different view of Obamacare. Oh, he has a different view of foreign policy. Oh, he has a different view of taxation. No, he's mentally ill and he's going to get us all killed. The president didn't undo anything in this Iran deal. The Iran deal is set up to be re-upped every 90 days, and he simply decided not to, and for some very good reasons. And if you don't know what the Revolutionary Guard is, shame on you, not him. If you don't know who Hezbollah is, shame on you, not him. 
the left in the media, the left in Hollywood, the left in the political sphere of Congress, they sound as crazy as these Iranian commanders, our enemies. The whole world is going to be in danger. The whole world is in danger. But they'll never just admit we disagree. And that's where the whisper campaign comes in. Now, I love the bias of stories. Joss Magnus writes, It used to be one of the lesser known amendments of the United States Constitution. First of all, we live in the United States of America. You guys have seen the research, right? Eight and ten can't tell you what the First Amendment is. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just guessing if 70% don't know the First Amendment, they probably don't know what the 25th is. But lately, more and more people are talking about it. Really? I haven't heard anybody talking about the 25th Amendment. I've heard people talking about the new tax reform that isn't really reform. The Iran Agreement, the Vegas shooter, the NFL, Harvey Weinstein. I mean, I hear people talking about a lot of things. I haven't heard one person bring up the 25th Amendment. Why is there such increasing conversation about the 25th Amendment? Adopted in February of 1967. The 25th Amendment says that the president can be removed from office if a majority of his own cabinet determines the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. Now, I don't think the president is so physically ill that he can't do his duties. I certainly see no evidence that he's mentally ill. I do happen to believe liberalism could possibly very well, I think I'm convinced, is a mental illness. I know it's a spiritual disorder, but just because you disagree with them doesn't make them nuts. But that's just the most controversial part of the amendment. Why the 25th Amendment also lays out a line of succession for who would become the president and says the president can send a letter to the Speaker of the House or the pro tem in the Senate and he is temporarily unable to effectively act as the leader of the United States. So this is a conversation happening just in the left's mind. And then off a quote in Vanity Fair that Steve Bannon may or may not have said, about this or a conversation he had with the president but it's on the news and nobody's talking about it and other than the bots they pre-programmed in social media i don't think it's even trending yeah i give the president only a 30 percent chance of finishing his term by the way they create this problem or this controversy themselves and then they try to solve it well i mean we've even heard jackie spear A Democrat congresswoman from California. She agreed with Representative Al Greer on Wednesday. The president's showing erratic behavior, mental instability. He's placing the country in grave danger. Kim Jong-un isn't? The president is? Who's launching the missiles? Who's enriching the centrifuges? Who's getting them further and further and more and more accurate? Who's threatening Guam? Who's got a... A system of not only a missile delivery, but a warhead, and it's re-entering the atmosphere undamaged. Who's threatening with EMPs? So the president is taking action to protect that, and that makes him mentally unstable, erratic? Not giving Iran some kind of trust they haven't earned? Not designating the Revolutionary Guard like Hezbollah as a terrorist organization? Not assuming that... Ballistic missiles can be as dangerous, depending on the region, as a nuclear weapon? And that this only delays the inevitable of having a nuclear when the solution should be not ever allowing to get one? But it's a whisper campaign. They create these whisper campaigns. Ah, the 25th Amendment, the 25th Amendment, the 25th Amendment. Just like they were whispering impeachment, impeachment, impeachment. Neither of which are ever going to happen. Any more than them admitting they just disagree with them. And they lost. When will they ever get it through their thick head? They lost. You live in a bubble. Most of America really studies this stuff, really gets this stuff, really understands this stuff. Your whisper campaigns, your lies, your distortions, they're not working. Learn a lesson from the NFL who has to scratch its head and figure out, how do we say Donald Trump was wrong? Stand up for the national anthem or you're not playing. Uh, final thoughts from you, if you want, 855-400-SAVAGE next, or I'll take a turn at the final thought on the Savage Nation next.
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. You know, there are some things you don't need a talk show host or an author to explain to you. I'm Michael Del Jordan for Dr. Savage on the Savage Nation. He'll be back Monday. Headline, America's obesity epidemic reaches record high. Then you read this entire story from NBC News by way of the CDC. Paragraph after paragraph trying to figure out how it happened. Anybody can go to a state fair and tell you how fat America is. But overall, 70.7% of Americans are either overweight or obese. And it's a problem. The consequences of obesity... High blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, killing millions of Americans. The obesity epidemic. You know, remember how we were protecting everybody at restaurants from cigarette smoke? Man, you ought to protect them from the buffet. But it just goes on and on. Lack of sleep, this and that. Then they talk about exercise and sedentary lifestyle. Like they explore the whole story. Like nobody's figured out how you end up fat. You sit your way to fat. You eat your way to fat. You're digging your grave with your teeth. Do yourself a favor. Remember Uncle Michael told you. Have a light salad tonight. Get a can of Copenhagen. Smoke about a pack of Luckies. You know, burn some calories. Get thin the way we used to do with orange skin and skinny legs. Will they ever treat obesity the way they did smoking? I doubt it. See you next time on the Savage Nation and look forward to hearing Michael on Monday. So long, everybody. Savage.